The Ruth Frost Parker Center for Abundant Aging presents The Art of Aging, information and tips on how to experience life more abundantly as we age. Our hosts are John King and Rev. Beth Long Higgins, Executive Director of the Ruth Frost Parker Center in Marion, Ohio, an organization affiliated with the United Church of Christ. Hi, Beth. You know, last week we talked about how Al mentors younger individuals. Well, in today's episode, we're going to learn more about this remarkable man who has truly mastered the art of aging. Al Schleter was born 80 years ago in Ferguson, Missouri. As we will hear, Al was well into his 20s before he got to know anyone who was an African-American. However, he has committed his life to racial and economic justice. Al is a great storyteller, and he's going to share a few key turning points in his life which led to dedicating his life to service. Although I don't know Al personally, I do know that he serves as a source of inspiration for others, what I call an aging hero. I appreciate how honest he was in sharing so many personal stories of how he continues to grow throughout his life. He is a great role model in a time when it seems that there is less tolerance for others. What year were you born? 1st of July, 1940. And your grandparents, obviously, were a previous generation. Tell me about your maternal grandparents, what their lives were like. Oh, my maternal grandparents lived on a farm in Staunton, Illinois, which is about uh, an hour's drive from St. Louis. And, and this farm, when I was young, had no inside plumbing. The water they had got from a well they only heated one room, that was the kitchen in the winter time, uh, because there was a wood-burning cooking stove in the kitchen, and that was the source of the heat. And had a huge garden. They milked 20, 30 cows by hand, because there were no milking machines then. My grandmother helped my grandfather every morning and evening, and that was a major source of money, the milk and the my grandmother made butter from the cream off the milk. Was it their farm? Well, they never owned it. Like sharecroppers, they lived there close to 40 years, but they gave a portion of what they made, and the, uh, both crops and cash, to the owner of the farm. So they never owned the farm. I was really amazed by that. Did they uh, ever take any time off? No. no. I mean, with... When they had the cows, they never, I don't think, uh, I'm sure they never had a vacation in their whole lives. And uh, it was just, it was just their life. Both only had elementary school education. They could read. I never saw them reading ever. Maybe the Bible, of course. You did spend the night there sometime? <laughs> One time, I guess I must have been four or five years old. We stayed overnight and my sister was two years younger, so I remember we were told to get in our pajamas in the kitchen because that, that was warm. Then we ran up the stairs, and it was, it was the wintertime. It was really cold, and there was this feather bed, I mean, a true feather bed, and it, we, Marilyn and I got in the feather bed, and you kind of sank down into it, and it swallowed you up, and they put quilts over us, and then my grandmother brought up a... a smooth rock she had heated on the wood-burning stove and it was wrapped in a towel and she put it in the bed and we could put our feet on that. I felt like it was the most comfortable feeling since I left the womb. <laughs> Tell me about what your father was like. Ah, yeah, my father, he worked all the time and, and my only real contact with him was when I would help him on a work project. And so he was a very distant. My father used to always support the underdog. And uh, that came, I think, from his being involved with the union. He was a tool and die machinist, and he really was a union supporter. And ironically, not because of the money, but he he would tell stories about how unsafe it was until the union came on. And when the union came, they required the companies to put in safety measures. Well, he said when he started, virtually every machinist was missing a finger or a part of a finger or even uh, more of a limb. It, it became very safe. So he, he was really a strong union person. So one of their first big interests was caving. 
Tell me how you got into that. I have no idea where I became so fond of caves, uh, but Missouri Ozarks is filled with caves. And, and one of my friends, Dave, had a car, and uh, Dave and I were so interested, we proposed to the manager of Merrimack State Park that we would run the Fisher Cave. It had sidewalks through it that the CCC had put in in the 1930s during the Depression. And we, we would take people through with Coleman lanterns. We made a lot of money. We got 60% of the cave profits, but I was able to pay my year of college from my second summer there. I can remember so many nights, the Milky Way above, because it was totally dark there. I was just a very important experience. They didn't allow African Americans to come to the cave, but you did have a family oh. stop? There were a few things in my life that I reflect on frequently with deep regret. The Missouri Ozarks were known to not be very friendly to African Americans, but the one family, the man came up and parked and the man got out of the car and when he starts walking to the concession stand, my friend Dave and some of the three or other local kids that were uh, around the local people, they, they ran out the back door and said, Al, you take care of this one. I mean, uh, and when the man came up, he asked for the price to go through the cave, and I told him, but I know that I was not friendly as I would have been to most people. I was uneasy about the whole thing because of all of this, and uh, I suspect he obviously sensed that and went back to the car and didn't go through the cave. And I really wonder to this day, you know, if I had just been friendly, maybe he had gone through the cave. So in some ways, that and a few other instances have I've been sort of trying to make amends my whole life for insensitive times when I didn't b behave uh, the way I wish I had. Let's move on to your college years at Carleton College. You encountered a student who was quite racist at that point. Jerry Gertie, and uh, he, was, uh, he was from Georgia, the die-hard racist. I mean, to give the old spiels, all the slaves were so happy. This was, uh, you know, he had a great life. We took care of everything, and, and I mean, it was BS. So I was somewhat racially sensitive, and but I had never known really an African-American, but this was a real challenge to have someone who had these racist beliefs. And so it was a real education to confront him. When he talked about how happy they were, well, I said, well, you know, what about these thousands of lynchings? That's not, that's not a very happy conclusion to, to have, and uh, when you're forced to defend your own view, it gives much more personal insights into your beliefs and why that should be and things. So it was, I, I, I think I learned as much in the dorm as in the classroom in college. What, what years were, were you at college? I was there 58 to 62. So what kind of diversity did Carlton have? No, I didn't have any. I mean, it was one, one African-American, I think her name was Joyce Le Leidner or something. She became a, an attorney in uh, the Twin Cities. Uh, she was the only African-American there for the first two or three years I was there. The last year, the, they opened up a little more, but very, very few. So I never was exposed to African-Americans in high school as an undergraduate. Um, uh, it was very sad. So I, I did pretty well at Carleton. I did well in chemistry and got accepted in the graduate school at Iowa State. And just by chance, I ended up on this research group with oh, 10 other guys. And every single one of us was interested in much broader issues. So we'd go to the student union for our supper every night, and we would have these gab sessions. And at that time now, the civil rights things were coming to a peak. The Vietnam War was heating up. So we, we would talk about all of these things. And uh, we all had a very strong social justice uh, focus. 
I use it as a period to reflect on what I wanted to do with my life. I decided I didn't want to be working in the laboratory doing research, but I really wanted to have some social justice part of my life. When you finished graduate school, uh, you had to make a choice of what to do next. What happened? Yeah, I had t two, two options. One was to do postdoctoral research. I mean, that's the stepping stone to getting a prestigious university position. But my draft board said if I took that, they couldn't guarantee me I wouldn't be drafted. And I certainly didn't want to go to Vietnam. The other option I had was a teaching position at Tougaloo College in Tougaloo, Mississippi. And because that gave me the chance to do something that I felt had some social justice component, I opted to do that. So Tougaloo was a small private college. Well, Tougaloo was founded actually by the United Church of Christ, and it was small. When I was there, it was only about 600 students. It was historically black university, and because it was private, the state of Mississippi had really no control of it. Jackson State is a big African-American university in Jackson that is state-run, and they could, they could put iron clamps on what they would do, but Tougaloo would invite the protesters, and uh, one James Meredith did the march to from uh, Oxford, Mississippi, to Jackson. Uh, Tougaloo was the host uh, place where the marchers stopped and spent the night before they did the last leg in the Jackson. So the state was frustrated because they couldn't couldn't control it. All faculty had to live on campus because if you it was not safe to live off campus. And so I wasn't paid much, but we were given free housing on the campus as part of the compensation. And in fact, it wasn't safe. It was manifest because of one year, the dean's house, someone cut through the fence and put a bomb at the back of the dean's house and blew the whole back of the house off. If anybody had been in that living room at the back, they'd been killed for sure, but no one was. So in my apartment, I was close to the dean's house, it nearly knocked, knocked me off the bed. It was a scary place to be. Two families agreed to integrate the school. That was the first year I was down there. And... Uh, so uh, we were part of the team to support the family, the Galloway family. They had four girls that integrated the school. Mr. Galloway was a farmer, but he also did carpentry work. And so he said his greatest reservation about integrating the school was that someone would come during the night and set the house on fire. And uh, he said, I gotta get a good night's sleep if I'm gonna do my work. And so part of why they agreed to integrate the school was that we, the faculty at Tougaloo said, we will uh, give you support. And when they first started integrating the school, we would have one faculty member at least would stay all night at their house and keep guard. So I volunteered and they said, well, you know, you have to, have you ever shot a gun? I said, no, I've never shot a gun. So Tony Lang, who had been in the military, he took me behind his house with this handgun and I shot a few times. So I said, I don't want to shoot anybody. He said, well, just shoot in the air and that'll probably scare them away. And what if they keep coming? Well, then shoot on the ground beside them. What if they keep coming? Well, they didn't give me an answer, but fortunately I never had to shoot anyone. And no one came, and then after two or three weeks, the Galloways felt secure enough. We could give up the, the armed guard duty. Al, you and your wife, Vienna, had a new baby, and she became uncomfortable living in the South. So you got another job at Central State, a prominent HBCU university near Xenia, Ohio. The job market was really tight then, but I got this job at Central State. I thought Central State would be and HBCU and in the North. So I thought, well, maybe this Vienna would be happier because we're closer to uh, her parents and my parents and we weren't in the South and, and all. And I thought maybe it'd be like, it'd be like Tougaloo uh, because I had a real strong connection with my students there. 
and uh, so we came here, and and uh, you know some things were very good about it, but the, I never had the strong connection to the students, and partly the reason it was the relationship at school was so strong is our whole life was the college. We were lived at the college. We were focused. The students would come to my my apartment for questions. I'd go to the dormitory to watch the football games. Uh, I mean, my, my my life was the college. Well, you had one experience you cited that uh, uh, was thought-provoking where you came into the lab yeah. and there were a couple of plumbers. A, in, in into, the, into the lecture hall. Yeah. I When I got to Central State, I was thinking, oh, man, I, you know, I don't have a racist bone in my body. I've been down at Tougaloo teaching. And uh, so at Central State, it was very, shortly after I got there, I come into the, my lecture hall. I had a class of 100 or 120 people I was supposed to teach. I, I'm a pretty serious teacher, and I always like to begin on time. But when I walked in, there were two plumbers uh, working on... The, there was a lab bench in the front of the lecture hall to do demonstrations and things. Uh, one of the plumbers was black, one was white, and they were working on a leak or something. And so I, uh, wanting to start the class on time, I went up to the plumbers and, and uh, asked, uh, you're going to be done by 10 o'clock so I can start my lecture, aren't you? And I found myself addressing the question to the white plumber. Well, turned out the white plumber was sort of a younger guy than the other, and he was the apprentice. The, the main plumber was the African-American guy, the, the journeyman plumber. And I, w I realized what I had done fairly quickly. I felt so stupid how insensitive I had been but it came because I, I have racism. I mean, I have implicit bias. So the idea that I didn't have a racist bone in my body was totally absurd. So that the lesson I learned is that I have to develop a compensating mechanism because if I go on autopilot, I'm going to make these mistakes all the time. So my compensating mechanism that I've used ever since, and I have not made... I mean, certainly not made that serious an error, was when I come to, if I encounter a group of people and I have a question to ask, and I will look at the African-American, if there's African-American or white, or if it's a male-female, I'll address the question to the female. But this is what I have to do to compensate for th those things that are part of my brain and I can't change. So at this point, you and Vienna decided to adopt a child. So Vienna was okay having another child, except she didn't want to give birth to one. So we checked into adoption, and they they first said, well, if you want a white child, you have to wait a couple of years, you know. And they said, we could, well, we got lots of uh, hard-to-place children. Uh, so I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to take a hard to play well, but hard to place meant black or biracial. So uh, so we signed up to adopt the first hard to place child. And as a result, we got my son, Eric. I'm just really proud of Eric. And, and it's ironic that uh, my daughter and I are genetically connected, but we're so very different and had a, a difficult relationship. My son and I have no genetic connection and we don't look alike, but he and I, uh, man, we, we were really bonded. And, uh, and when he was after puberty, when people would call the house, they'd say, Eric? They said, no, this is Al. They, they couldn't distinguish his voice the <laughs> same as mine. And some of my uh, Central State students would say, I can tell he's your, his mannerisms are sort of the same as mine. And so, uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm a believer that it's uh, nurture and not nature is the important factor, but that's just from my experience with Eric. You got a Fulbright to Liberia. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, that, that was my marriage was, was breaking up and, and uh, Vienna didn't want to go, but uh, I thought it would be a good experience for, uh, for Eric and also Tracy, but 
and uh, but Tracy opted not to go. So Eric and I went to Liberia, West Africa, for a year in 1983-84, and I taught at the University of Liberia. So that was a for Eric, it was a life-changing experience because he <laughs> he wrote an essay for when he applied to college and. He, he, he just said, in that part of the essay, he said, I have you know, been raised in a white family. And he said, we get to Liberia. He said, there are black people everywhere. You know, the policemen and the, all the the airport officials, everyone's black, you know. So it was just, it really had a very significant effect on him. And he became a much a more serious student when we got back from that. Finally, after you retired, you yeah. developed a relationship with Rwanda. How did that start? I was at loose ends there for a while. So I was in Boston. I was at one event. There was a woman, uh, Sister Anna Beatu, who was from Rwanda, and she was getting a master's degree at Boston College. And so I started talking with her. And the genocide in Rwanda happened in 1994, and this was a few years after that. And she said, and so I started telling her, about, telling her about my experience in Liberia and Ghana. She said, Al, you should come to Rwanda. We need help so much. And you know, I said, well, you know, I'd be up for that. You know, and she you had, do you have any contacts? So she gave me the names of two people. I emailed them. And not too long later, I got replies from both of them saying, if you get here, we'll, you know, we'll uh, put you up. But Brother Stratton, it was the headmaster of the Ecole des Sciences in Bimana. It was a high school, but it was a science high school. It was the best in the country, and I can say that with perfect truth because they take a national exam and they had scored the highest on, on it. And so he said, Al, you come here, you can have a room in our, the brothers' living quarter. It was run by the Marist brothers, and there were, oh, seven or eight Marist brothers living in, a, like, a dormitory. They gave me a room. I got three, ate three meals a day with the Marist brothers, and uh, first time I couldn't teach chemistry because everything was in French because it had been a Belgian colony. I knew French, but not enough to be fluent. But they let me teach chemistry lab, and I taught English. All the students took English. I didn't expect to go back. I thought I'd go one time, but I was so impressed with what they had, the progress they had made since the genocide, and how I felt they were doing all the right things. That it, I felt proud that I could be part of it. But then the I went back three more times, and after the first time, the country switched in one year from the language being French to the language being English. Well, they had a huge need because their library had all books in French. Oh, and Brother Stratton said, we need a biology lab. So I got Dale Allen, a friend, a PhD biologist. Uh, he came with me and we set up a biology lab the second time. And then I could teach the chemistry class because it now it was in English. So yeah, I really, really had a good time. Part of this cultural thing is that the brother, Maris brothers that ran the school were R Rwandan. They came from very poor backgrounds. They're Catholic. And you know, so the, I had nothing. I didn't have, my skin color was different. I came from a, a very different economic level. I, they were Catholic. I'm not, I'm not religious at all. But man, we bonded. Uh, Brother Stratton has been to Yellow Springs four times. He stays with me each time he comes. I'm really very close to them. I still have contact. His birthday is in, is just in a few days. I always send him an e-card, you know. Well, I mean, you help them adapt to English by bringing some of them. Oh to... yeah, the Yellow Springs Community Foundation funded a program that enabled us to bring, for the first time, two teachers and two students came to the high school. They came for six weeks. And it was that was really important because the teachers were trying to transition from French to English. And uh, they, you know, some of them were having a little difficult time. So those two teachers, it was profoundly helpful for them. Uh, Fidel Habugimana came, a biology teacher. And uh, and Eugenia uh, was a math teacher, 
and and uh, the, both of them when they, when they went back, their English was good. They were immediately promoted and given higher positions. The students, I think, had a really big impact on the high school kids because they're very able. And that first student, Tony Gasana, ended up going to the Air Force Academy and graduated from the Air Force Academy. And now he's a very high position in the Rwandan Air Force. Uh, so it, it was a very good program. So you helped the school in so many ways, but one way was you developed a sponsorship program. Oh yeah, the first time I went there, there were so many genocide orphans, kids that whose both parents had been killed. When the first time I went there, the cost of a year at the school was $175. That's room, board, tuition, everything. So it seemed pitifully little, but they couldn't. I mean, no mother and father. And Brother Staten, you know, he said it was terrible to tell people they, he, that they couldn't, he had to kick them out. So uh, a couple in Boston and I started a sponsorship program. At one point, we had 150 people that sponsored a, uh, a student at Bimana. And so we would, every time I go over there, I would interview the students and, and they would write a letter and then I would bring the, uh, the letters back to the, to the sponsoring family. And we did that for five, six, and maybe 10 years. But after a certain time, the genocide is, had went farther and farther away, so there weren't so many orphans of the genocide, so we stopped doing it. And the last time you went, I was amused by how they wanted you to bring a solar panel. Uh, so yeah. tell about how you got that solar panel to <laughs> Rwanda. <laughs> yeah, Fidel, who came during the first time to Yellow Springs High School, when he had gone back, they had asked him to be principal of this school. And so he accepted and he became the headmaster of this school. But the school was way, way off the main road and they were off the grid. There was no electricity in the whole village and anywhere not near it. Uh, but Phil Lemkow, a physics teacher at the Yellow Springs High School, had retired. And so we said, well, let's bring a solar panel to Fidel's school, and it was 50 pounds, which is a perfect uh, weight because that's what you can take as an accompanying bag. And so we had this solar panel kit, and we brought it with us on the plane. And then we, when we got to Bimana, we had to get to the school. So we could take the a taxi on the road about you know, a part of the way, but then we had to take the side road off. Well, the road was in such a disrepair that no taxi, no four-wheeled taxi could take it, but they have uh, motorcycle taxis. And we were able to commandeer two motorcycle taxis and fill one on one, and I went on the other. We had this 50-pound solar panel thing. I, balance, I think I was had the balance on my lap, and the, the roads were so rutted, and it, but we made it, and we stayed there several days, and we installed the solar panel on the roof of one of the buildings, and the next day I went down, I wanted to see if it was working, and we had had like eight ports that you could plug in to uh, charge cell phones and things. So I, was, I took my laptop, and I couldn't even plug it in because there were eight cell phones and laptops plugged into the to, into all the outlets of the thing, but it was working. And uh, Fidel said it was so great, he was able to conduct evening classes for some of the adults in the village to learn English and all. And so uh, uh, Aurelia took another one uh, to him, and so he, he's got two of them now. Since I've known you, which is quite a while, I've been very aware of how you've always been an avid gardener who is very generous with your produce. <laughs> I guess it's some of that latent uh, work ethic that comes from my culture. I, I don't like sitting around doing nothing. Uh, and so for several years, I ended up growing way, way more than I can eat. And I hated most of all to see it go to waste. So I started taking some to the uh, food pantry in town. And so they 
distribute, uh, you know, I put it on the table when the people that come to the food pantry can get fresh uh, vegetables, and they, they're very appreciative of that. Sometimes I get too much even for the food pantry, so they put a, a box out at the street, and uh, sometimes there are three or four cars lined up. Uh, one year I had too many summer squash, and so, but I, I get rid of most everything without going to waste. Well, just wrapping up, yeah. uh, as you reflect on your life, uh, what are your feelings about how you've lived your life? I'm feeling... I'm feeling satisfied. Is uh, I'm feeling so thankful for all those experiences that broadened my perspective. I'm more sensitive to others. I I just feel really content. I hope others have the same kind of feeling. I mean, I guess a few years or even it was up to a few years ago, death would have been sort of a scary thing, but. Uh, you know, I feel I've I've made a difference, that I have uh, accomplished something. So what better feeling can you have, you know, the feel you've made a difference, affected people's lives. And, you know, I'm still in contact with some of my Tougaloo students and uh, so proud of what they've done. And it's it just rewarding. Truly, that was the story of a man who has strived throughout his life to be a better person. Many thanks to Al for sharing some of the stories of the people, places, and lessons that continue to contribute to his own sense of purpose and meaning in the world. I agree, Beth. You know, I know Al and realize that many of us do not share our life stories with each other. I appreciate getting to know him even better. In our next episode, we're going to meet Stu Maddox, a filmmaker who produced and directed Gen Silent, which is the story of how people in the LGBT community often experience unique fears and challenges as they age. This podcast was funded in part by the Dayton Foundation, Del Mar Encore Fellows Initiative, and the Ruth Frost Parker Center for Abundant Aging, a program of United Church Homes. Audio production and interviews were conducted by Delmar Fellow Eric Johnson.